The best years of the liberal state are finished. I think we actually have to reinvent the algorithm of some version of a capacity, a capability that represents a larger public, that enables a larger public. But the kind of liberal state we have today is not a good venue. I think the, the high point of the liberal state is really the 20th century and with all its horrors, <laughs> because it certainly had many horrors from Russia to the US to you know, Europe, etc. But uh, it, was, it had a project, and the project was really enabling some sort of making of a, of a middle class, a prosperous working class. That was a distributed, you know, it was a project that was about distributing, distributing, jobs, returns. Uh, now that's done, beginning in the 1980s in an invisible way. And now it's finally becoming brutally visible, I would say, in the last 10 years. But it really is a history that starts 30 years ago. You have a different set of alignments, and it is linked to globalization, but it is also linked to a recovery of very old corporate profit-seeking logics. And so you outsource because it's cheaper. You, you, know, you try to have lo as low wages as possible. You know, it is, so it is both globalization which enables firms to have a global geography of production and exploitation, if you want, and it is old logics of profit-seeking, of domination by firms. So these two come together and they have a devastating effect. So what I find extremely interesting is that in these last uh, manifestations that we have seen all over the world, it is the modest middle class who is the historic actor. I mean, that is a shock to most of us who have always seen a raw actor of history, you know, the working class, the exploited proletariat. The sons and daughters of the modest middle classes, they are the historic actor. That makes me think, and that to me comes really back to this relationship with the liberal state. The, the modern liberal state, the liberal state of the 20th century, is a state that flourishes in a very particular political economy. It is a political economy dominated by mass manufacturing, mass consumption. Workers mattered. People mattered as workers and as consumers. It was not a nice system. It was not because they mattered because they were human beings. No, there were all kinds of expulsions, discriminations, violations, abuses, sufferings on the part of many people. But at the heart of the system was a dynamic that needed people as workers and as consumers. Out of that comes a kind of happy marriage between the needs of a growing, increasingly urbanized, uh, industrial workforce, a petty bourgeoisie, you know, that whole setting. Now, that story is over. It's finished. I think that today, I mean, this is sort of my take, I, I developed this in a little book that I just finished, that I call Expulsions. I think the logic today is a logic of expelling people. If I put myself at the edge of the system, 50 years ago, I saw that the system brought in people as I said, as workers and as consumers. Today, if I look what happens at the edge of the system, the edge of the system is not the border. Huh? The edge of the system is a systemic edge. It's right there, runs in the middle of Wall Street, in the middle of Sao Paulo, multiple edges. It sort of lets people go. The way it expels them, the way it sort of pushes them out, takes many, many different forms. So in the case of the United States, an enormous amount of incarceration of minority workers, a vast number of people who will never have a job. We now have large numbers of young men who are, well, in their 20s, late 20s and their 30s, who have never held a job. So it's sort of a mass of humanity that m no longer matters. In the case of countries in the global south, uh, it takes other forms. A crucial dynamic there is what we call land grab massive amount of land buying by foreign, by about 17 countries, 
and over a hundred firms that have bought, you know, tens of millions of hectares of land. So the question is, when a country wants to make a plantation to grow palm, and it buys uh, two million hectares somewhere in Africa, in Brazil, what happens? It evicts faunas, floras, uh, villages, little small holder agriculture, rural manufacturing, they're expelled. When they then migrate to the cities, it's barely migration, that's an expulsion. And so they feed the favelas, they feed the slums, they feed the villas miserias. So I think we have really entered an epoch where the liberal state is in a, in a decaying mode we don't have to, I don't want to throw out the state, by the way. We need strong states. But the, the epoch of the strong liberal state that had a project, it was a narrow project, but still, it meant a prosperous working class, a growing middle class, public infrastructures, public education, public housing, uh, public transport, all of that. That has sort of come to an end. Look at any of our liberal states. None of them has the money, except maybe Brazil. <laughs> you know, there are a few. Uh, to, to do the kind of infrastructural work, setting up whole vast spaces where firms could operate, workers could operate, schools could operate. None of, our, none of our governments has that kind of money. The Chinese are about to run out of money. <laughs> they have been doing it, etc. So I do think it's a very particular period, and the manifestations have to be seen in that larger context, I think. I think they are the beginning of a history. This is by no means over. It's just the first little appearance of a historic process. When Castell says that these movements are about recovering public space, I think they use the little bits of public space that are left mm -hmm. and they grab spaces that have never been thought of as public space. Terrier Square is a traffic <coughs> space. And they make it into public space because, and that is why they are different, these movements are different than, than, than earlier demonstrations of the 60s and the 70s. Mm -hmm. But the aim, the aim is actually a very modest aim. This is not the heroic revolutionaries, you know, of the, of the Russian Revolution, no, nor is it the, the heroic syndicalisms, you know, of the end of the 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s. This is very basic stuff. And that is why the state is the interlocutor. They are not against... They're not going against financial firms. They're not going against financial markets. They're not going against the big multinationals, as was the case in the 60s and the 70s. They are asking the state, give me a job. Make my education degree work. Make housing cheaper. The state is the interlocutor. And that is why, for me, it captures the beginning of a history which is really a late 1800 and especially a 20th century history, which is the emergence of these middle classes, these vast middle classes. And the middle classes have always kept a low profile. You know, they, I mean, I know, I know they produce some revolutionaries and some whatever, but you know, the middle class is a very particular segment. So I, I don't see this as making public space. I see this using public space to make claims against the state and to ask the state for a reasonable condition of life. I mean, I think perhaps some of the most uh, illustrative of these demonstrations were in Tel Aviv, where for the first time you had 100,000 people manifesting. And they were not trying to bring the government down. They were saying, you know, I want to live in Tel Aviv, I want to work in Tel Aviv, I have a job in Tel Aviv, give me cheaper housing. Make, make it, you know, make it work. So it's a very peculiar mode. And what I find absolutely fascinating here is that they have the memory through their parents that the state once gave them a lot of stuff and that enabled 
four, five generations, you know, to every generation gets a little better. And now suddenly, they are on the other side of the curve. It's not happening. You see, and rather than going against the corporate economy, going against, going against you know, the financial markets, I mean, the financializing, I think, the financializing of the economy is what is the real problem here. It, you know, that we can get to that later, maybe. But that is sort of my take on this. There is a sentence, a phrase that you hear a lot in the world in the last 10 years. It comes especially from certain sectors. It's not a universal statement. And that is that a billion people went out of poverty. That has to be really examined carefully. 600 million of those are in China. 200 million of those are in India, and they're mostly very prosperous middle class. And then you have Brazil, and that's about it. The other thing is that uh, uh, something that has received much less attention is the fact that there is a monetizing of poverty. So before these people may have owned a little farm, eaten rather well, modestly, modest lives, sold in the local town the goods that they made, uh, uh, but maybe more exchange. But a lot of people now have become sort of like a proletariat, a very poor proletariat. So suddenly from having no monetized income, because they lived in a sort of an, a more an economy, a minimalist economy, you know, where they produced their own food, etc., and then they bought a few things and sold a few things. So now a lot of these people are very poor laborers, Yes, they have a monetized income. They get money for their work. But they eat less, they, they don't have, they don't sleep enough, they're super exploited. So this has to be taken with great care. This, these last 20 years were not a generous, beneficent period in our, you know, in our history. They were brutal. Yes, you have a middle class that got richer than they ever thought they would get. Really rich. In India, in China, in the United States, in Brazil, in Ecuador, in Nigeria, in South Africa, you name it, in Malaysia, everywhere. And I, be, I, was, I was detecting these trends already way back in the 1990s because the structuring of the economy helped in that. So what you really have is an impoverished, broad middle class. You also begin to see that even in China, but there it's going to take longer. I know that in Brazil you have a prosperous, new, modest middle class, and you have that in China as well. But you know, there are limits to that. But in most of Latin America, in most of North America, in most of Europe, in much of Africa, you do not have that. You have very rich elites, a very, very well-off, 20% rich middle class, and then the older traditional uh, middle class, uh, they, they are losing ground, actually. Yeah? And then this question of some of the poor enter the money economy, and suddenly they are classified as less poor. I think that we really need far, we need anthropological kind of study, we need ethnographic study to establish that. I think many people have made it out of incredible poverty and young people certainly prefer to be poor in cities with a very low income wage and unhealthy food than being back home with the parents on the small farm, clean air, better food even though very modest and no and no money income. So I think that the question of what we humans <laughs> Prefer, which is a certain kind of complexity in our life, is one way of putting it. So I'd rather be very poor in a city than have better food and better air quality uh, in a little farm but be very isolated. See, these are all issues that come into the picture. But I think the main point here is, yes, a billion people have left a non-money economy and moved into the money economy. They actually have money they can spend. But are they no longer poor, or is it a different kind of poverty? And what is the trajectory of this poverty? We now know that low-wage workers will not achieve 
a kind of gradual you know, bettering in their lives, as they did for much of the 20th century. When we look at the whole debate on surveillance by national states of uh, its citizens, um, I think that many, many features come to the fore, I would say. The first one is the amount of material instruments, buildings that are in play in order to have this. So there is something extremely visible, and yet we do not see it. You know, to me, in the United States, there are over 10,000 massive buildings that have been there uh, at least since 2010, full-time surveillance of citizens and firms, and we now know <laughs> beyond the borders of the United States. Uh, it's so much materiality, but we don't see it. That to me is an extraordinary fact about our contemporary world. You know, that, that we, we, because, we, because it's an unknown zone, we do not see it. We are so bombarded with information, with stuff, etc., that if, if it doesn't come through certain channels, we don't see it. The second issue is the logic of the surveillance apparatus. It does 24 hour you know every day of the year year after year uh, gathering of data all our emails all our acts of communication etc etc uh, the logic is in order to catch those two or three dangerous actors could be a firm could be an individual every year we have to assume that everybody in the territory of the country is suspect. That is the logic. So I ask with this, who are we, the citizens? There is a huge apparatus on top. It's very transnational up there. It has, you know, mathematicians from all over the world, good algorithm builders from whatever, you know, if you're best algorithm builder, is somewhere in Malaysia, you bring it. You know, so it's very international up there, which I find very nice. You know, that's sort of a nice part of it. But the real question is, given that logic, given that in order to, to secure the country from threats, the first step is that all of those who reside in the country are suspect, and hence we need to gather data about all of them. That is a very peculiar logic. That is truly a rupture with, uh, with the French Revolution model and with the American model. The state is me and I am the state. No, this is the state as a separate kind of actor. And so, and the third uh, element is, does this mode of securing a country, of bringing security to a country, does it work? Does it actually work? It doesn't work very well, really. I mean, we don't know that. It's difficult to establish. But for the, the party that is a real winner, I'm not sure the state is a winner. I'm not sure we the citizens are winners. But the party that is a real winner are the big tech companies. This is huge superstructure, technical superstructure, in order to find that possible terror. Clearly one of the key spaces for people in the world are cities, and increasingly so. Uh, that is happening everywhere. And, and the question then is, what is a city? And one of my arguments is that a lot of built up terrain is not a city. It is just built up terrain. If you have row after row after row of office buildings, that is not a city. That is just a densely built up terrain. If you have row after row, like outside Shanghai, you know, 5,000 high rise buildings with just residences and nothing else, that is not a city. So, one issue in, in, in addressing some of the major challenges, you know, that, that we 
that we face when it comes just to the built environment is can we secure what London has, for instance. London has about 37 little centers in its, you know, in its city space. New York is not as good as that. Paris is also quite a bit, but not as good as London. London is quite extraordinary in that sense. And so they have succeeded in having smaller communities which are more governable, where the, the residents feel that this is my community, I, I am a constitutive member of this community. And, 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 uh, and sort of it just works better. It's a more civilizing condition than these mega cities where you have one huge center and then the rest becomes a huge back area. Now, if I had the power to redesign a few of these situations, and I absolutely don't have it, nor do I have the technical skills, then I would say that scaling is critical. So yes, you want density. Yes, you want, in many cases, a complex, large space. London is huge, but you wouldn't know it. It's very low rise. But make it so that there are these centers, these nodes, because those nodes civilize urban space. Where you have begin to have the, the decay of urban space is if you have excessive high-rise buildings, you know, all concentrated, like I would say certain parts of Manhattan are just too much and at night they're dead space. That's not good, that's not city, right? But the, the other end is, of course, very poor neighborhoods, the slums, the favelas, the villas miserias and all of that. Now, we, I, I think, again, if I had my, I, I would say this is a time to make new cities. Why does it have to be this huge mega space? build new cities, create a center, create, you know, but many, 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 not luxury, not what the Nigeria did. They wanted their own rich, city for the rich, so they built Abuja, which is so expensive that only the rich can live there. I mean, the middle classes are there too. And they said, Lagos is too big, we're leaving. That is not a solution. You would just raise the quality of life of a lot of people. And you would have a chance to build green cities. You know, we have underestimated how the city, every part of the city is a, is a combination of elements that can work with the biosphere in a way that a plantation cannot. A plantation is elementary. A plantation means you have to push out faunas and floras, make it very, and then you bring in all the chemicals. So, I, I, let me just give you a little example of how the city, having multiple cities and having green cities would be absolutely fantastic. And it would keep, it would create again a prosperous working class and a modest middle class. So, I, I have done a lot of work on, on, on how biology, the knowledge of biology, is, and I think it's just phenomenal what's happening there, but it's all in the laboratories. I mean, there are some applications. So one of them is a bacterium that they discovered that if you put it in brown organic waters, what we produce in kitchens and bathrooms, you know, uh, it actually produces a molecule of plastic, but it's a plastic that is biodegradable. So it's durable, resistant, but biodegradable. Plastics are something we need in everything we do. Imagine what is now a real negative for cities, all those brown waters, often disposed of in non-environmentally sustainable way, like putting it into landfills and it becomes methane gas, and now we have explosions on golf courses and that kind of stuff, so, you know, it's just not good, or trucks, you know, um, becomes actually an export industry for cities. They export a plastic or they export the, the waters so that they can make a plastic or they export the plastic. City after city. And there are many other. The, the other one that I love is a bacterium that if you put it in concrete, uh, it actually seals off the wall, seals off greenhouse emissions, stops them and eventually actively purifies the air around it. That means that a city, yes, it is producing environmental damage by definition, but it also can activate its own particular formats, lots of concrete, lots of brown water, 
to actually work with the biosphere. So when I think of making all those new cities, I think jobs, I think greening, I think bringing scientists, technologists, etc. into the making of these cities. Not to make these high-tech smart cities, which I don't believe in, but to make a working city where every citizen knows that they are contributing their part. That is right. And they would have to be fairly small, but they would be cities rather than endless rows of slums, endless rooms of, you know, of office buildings. It's this notion of a decentralized making of energy. And, and uh, when Edison, you know, in the United States, he thought every household would have its source. But from the perspective of an emergent corporate economy, as was the case in the United States, this was not a good idea. The big corporates wanted to centralize. And so I think that if we work with the environment, if we work with the biosphere, with biologists, with technologists who are interested in the environmental question, we could actually achieve a far more distributed making of energy. Every building, every little house has multiple ways in which it can generate energy. Every household could be quite self-sufficient. And then there are very simple devices, like the famous plastic bottles, you know, get the, you know, you know the, I think it's, it's from Brazil, actually. Yes. You know, these are very elementary. That is not so much uh, making energy as using very elementary things that every household has, even a poor household. So there is a kind of knowledge that exists but that has to become far more widespread, you know, because when people become aware that right now they, we could be doing far more than we do. We exist in old environment, built environments where it's not easy, but building new cities to address the slum question and all of that, it just could be a revolution. And you know what? It would bring back a prosperous working class, a prosperous middle class, and I think some version of a democratic state with a lot of distributed sources of energy and of politics.